the dark cosmos. Stay cosmic. Nightfall. In a matter of moments, the high walkways and bridges, narrow passageways and tunnels, elevators and trains, all drained empty of people. What was once imagined as the perfect Terran colony was now engulfed by silence and stillness, unknown on any other planet inhabited by living beings. Even dead planets saw their fair share of movement and sound, greater than that of the streets of Gamma Neom at night. Sapphire! A call from somewhere deep inside the living spaces of Sector 9 broke the quietude. Sapphire! A hint of worry in the repeating call. We must seal the compartment. Where are you? The lights outside blinked rapidly five times to signal the end of the day. Then they slowly dimmed until everything became dark gray. Power only where necessary. The city was now in shadow, becoming even more claustrophobic than it felt during the day. Tension immediately increased inside the dismal compartment where the power maintenance crew lived, partitioned between water safety and food rations for their vertical. The elder calling out to Sophia was risking her life and those of every other person cramped along with her, fearing the dead of night. But she couldn't just let Sophia stay outside no matter if she could handle herself in the face of the most prominent dangers in Gamma Neom. Shut it! Lock the door! Voices called out to Vera from inside the compartment while she stood next to the open safety night seal and peeked out for any sight of Sophia. There was nothing except the looming half-darkness and a few harsh shadows dancing under the glow of the neon lights, which lined the rails of the sector trains. Fee! Vera started panicking. Muffled talking momentarily sounded behind her, together with rushed footsteps and shuffling, as everyone was trying to find a good hiding spot in case one of the nightcrawlers got inside their tight living space. Miserable old fool, she heard mumbling behind her, coupled with a few heavy steps. Shut it, Abraham snarled at Vera, grabbing at the hatch and pushing it to close. Before the elder could even react, two delicate hands appeared at the opening, pushing in the opposite direction. Wait, Vera pleaded and Abraham stopped pushing. A girl of barely 16 managed to slip through the opening, closed the door, and secured the night seal behind her quickly. Vera sighed, relieved to see her granddaughter return unharmed. Abraham, on the other hand, was ready to teach her a lesson. Don't say anything I don't already know. Sophia said, squeezing by him on the way to her bunk. I was dumb. I know. And irresponsible. I know. And dangerous. Uh, leave her be. Vera interrupted Abraham, then turned to the girl. Did you get it? Some of the people that were hiding near Sophia's bunk had gathered around in anticipation to see if she had collected the thing that Vera had sent her out at sundown to find. Sophia noticed their inquisitive stares as she was taking off her backpack. It was loaded with something heavy. Vera pressed through the small crowd, nursing a limp with her metal cane and stopped close to her granddaughter. Abraham, 
towering some two heads over the old woman, followed closely. Well, he said, did you? Was the risk worth it? Sophia smirked. There were only three rules guiding the Gamma Neomian society, but only one truth. Humans are pliable creatures. Very few people knew this truth, yet it was a fact that permeated from the very foundations of the Line City encircling the single habitable planet in the Trappist-1 system, tidally locked to its star. Remember, citizens, never stay up at night. Always lock your doors and remember to check your energy consumption. His Majesty, the Terran Prince, salutes you for your obedience. Voice throughout Gamma Neom during the day, every hour, on the hour. It was the third time after the artificial sunup that Neri, the voice of the city, addressed its denizens across all verticals and sectors. In return, everyone that was caught on the streets of Gamma Neom or was in hearing distance of the AI voice would call out their hail to the Terran dynasty that made life on their Earth-like planet possible. Hear, hear! Private Charlie Miller said automatically, standing tall and straight in front of the governor's chambers high up in Sector 1. He had been enlisted to accompany his commanding officer during her talk with the Terran governor that ruled Gamma Neom in the prince's stead. Charlie was feeling sleepy and would have much preferred to slump down and enjoy the warmth of the artificial sun that created the illusion of day in their city. The previous night had been rough on his troop. There was some night trouble in the public sector, and his team was dispatched to deal with it. Charlie had almost no sleep. <sighs> There's always trouble there, he thought, and squinted his eyes from the blinding light that came in through the large window on his right. A grin appeared on his face as he fell into a nice daydream relaxing his shoulders and his grip on his electro-laser rifle, forgetting all about Sector 5. He could stand next to those windows all day, gazing out between the narrow walls of Gamma Neom, or catching the faintest view of the sky that only those in Sector 1 could see. The moons of Trappist 1D, the third rock orbiting a dwarf star, were a spectacular thing to behold. It was a shame that no one was out at night to enjoy them fully. And don't think for a moment that I won't be taking this up the command chain, Governor. You seem to be forgetting where your duties lie. Commander Chen's voice echoed from the chambers. The door was slightly ajar, and it had only let out whispers and hushed disagreements moments prior. The commander's sudden yell shook up Charlie, making him immediately straighten up, adjusting the grip on his electrolaser. It chased his daydreams away too. Walk, Private. Chen barked at him as she was exiting the chambers, leaving a rattled and confused governor behind. There's work to be done. If you permit me, Commander, we barely had any rest. No time. But sir... Chen stopped and faced Charlie, growling at him. Don't mistake my lenience with friendship, Private Miller. If I say move, you move. If I say no sleep, until the end of days, you will die on your feet. 
She paused and looked him up and down as the fire in her eyes softened a bit. Twenty years ago, your father begged me to take you and make a soldier out of you. He wanted the good life for his son. Don't make us both regret that decision. Understood? Yes, sir. Once you make lieutenant, you'll get better familiarized with the pressures of running this place. For now, you just have to be obedient. Bad news comes from down below. There'll be no rest until it's been handled. Chen spoke while walking, with Charlie following after her, donning a solemn expression on his face and a formal soldier's gait. He understood Chen's harshness, even if the treatment he got bothered him. There surely must have been some empathy nestled inside the commander's heart. That was the sole reason he was up in Sector 1, and not back down in the slums where he was born. They walked the rest of the way through the tight corridors of the city hall in silence and sink, only greeting the military guards that were placed in front of the chamber doors of each sector official. Gamma Neon was on high alert. Charlie had heard some of the exchange between Chen and the governor, but he didn't realize how serious it was until the commander began barking at him. There seemed to be a rebel snitch caught lingering on the outskirts of Sector 3, disturbing the delicate sensibilities of the low echelon politicians and their families that live there. One of the military spouses that were housed in the higher levels of Sector 4 saw him and alerted the military of his presence. He was the courier of the bad news that Chen spoke about. The rebels were planning an assault, and this time, they appeared to be well prepared to do some serious damage to Gamma Neom. Once Charlie and his commander had left the pristine white of the city hall and had rejoined the rest of his troop in the weapons charging corner of the high walkway, the news was confirmed with a single order. We move at sundown. Let's get these animals before they destroy everything we have built. Chen boomed over the heads of her subordinates. <sighs> Sundown. Charlie's lower lip quivered at the thought, and he shot a glance at Miriam. Her eyes widened, and he knew they both had the same thing on their minds. <sighs> Not again. I can't run from them again tonight. As far as Charlie and Private Miriam Cohen were concerned, the rebels were only a nuisance to be dealt with. What came out at nightfall was the real deal. The terror. The biggest problem they could face. Remember, citizens. Never stay up at night. Always lock your doors and remember to check your energy consumption. His Majesty, the Terran Prince, salutes you for your obedience. No one in the housing compartment of the 25th vertical of Sector 9 ever returned Neri's call. In fact, everyone that either worked or lived below Sector 5 had stopped hailing the Prince decades ago. When it came to the rules, they were the ones most cognizant of them, the ones most affected, the ones that didn't have the military to protect them at night, or even less opportunity to buy power credits when they would run out. The lower sectors of Gamma Neom needed no supervision to remind them about how precious those rules were and how precarious breaking them was. Abraham was less angry with Safia for being late the previous night, but 
growing more and more impatient with Vera for making her go out at sundown in the first place. If anything would have gone wrong, it could have endangered their entire plan. The Nightcrawlers were the least of his problems currently. Are you sure that this would only take down the main terminal and nothing more? Vera asked him. Yes, I've seen the blueprints. Chief's privilege. He replied, wanting to remind the Elder of his social stature. I would have preferred it if we'd done this my way, but since Sophia already got the last piece needed for the machine, I'm willing to take the planned assault down a notch. Or two. Destroying the power inverter in Sector 12 would have costed us everything. Without it, we would lose access to the few remaining solar panels on Soulside. Forever. What use would we have of this city without power? Hmm? Did I remind you that the technology is obsolete? The Terrans made sure of that. A few of the rebels standing close to the Elder's table shook their heads angrily about Vera's last comment, affirming its vile implications. Long and prosperous living, Abraham. It's the only kind of survival that's acceptable. Safia added from the back of the room. When did you become so wise? Abraham asked playfully, but was glaring at her grandmother for letting her speak out of place. They don't know how to operate the inverter. Nor will they know, after the electromagnetic pulse, that it just needs to be restarted and the rest of the tech patch like we've been doing so far. We will have them in our grasp. No need for violence. Vera repeated her way of reasoning to reassure him that hers was not just the best, but the only way. Agreed. Two of the elders seated on either side of Vera supported her position. They will find a reason for violence, Vera. They always do. Abraham returned. Even with your stature as chief of this little piece of Sector 9, you are still the youngest soul on this table. Some of us have been here since you were still latched on your mother's tit. Some of us remember the previous revolt and how Terra Neon reacted to it. Some of the older rebels that were present in the meeting started whispering among themselves. They remembered what happened and all that they had lost that day. Abraham might have stood as chief officer of the 25th Vertical of Sector 9, but he had joined the rebellion not that long ago. His ideas were different. His experiences were lacking. He was ready to draw blood. Taking down the power was only step one, as far as he was concerned. So, Abraham got another plan going with some like-minded rebels that Vera and the rest of the Council of Elders wouldn't approve of. Actually, he had just gotten word that Franz, the supposed snitch, had fed the military information about their plan just as he was instructed to do. Abraham knew that they would send one of their special forces troops to take care of the problem in the public sector, where he and his men would be ready for them, waiting in ambush. Whichever soldier wouldn't be killed there, the Nightcrawlers would make sure they would never again reach Sector 1. After that, it would be a matter of taking down the rest of their soldiers, once the rebels had put enough fear in their minds that it could be done. Safia was studying Abraham during the meeting, and she noticed that there was something he was withholding from the rest of them. Sharp glances beyond the table to some younger rebels from the other compartments, and one or two nervous chuckles from the water safety crew told her that whatever he was planning 
wasn't a solitary venture. She made a personal note to keep watch on him when they would go out at sundown to engage the electromagnetic pulse in Sector 5, otherwise known as the public sector slicing Gamma Neom horizontally in half. Remember, citizen. Neary echoed promptly. Time was running short. Sundown was soon approaching. Here, here! Charlie's entire team hailed the prince, except for him and Chen. He was nervous, sweating. Charlie had barely survived the night crawlers the last time he faced them. If it wasn't for Miriam, he would have been crawler fodder. Dinner. A fleshy piece stuck in the toothy maw of one that had managed to grab him by the foot before he could enter the sector train. I'd rather be guarding the fat governor, he thought desperately. No one wanted that shift, for the governor was as hungry for young flesh as the crawlers were. Bet you'd rather be any place else. Chen addressed the troop. She made sure to make eye contact with every single one of them as she walked the line in which the eleven soldiers stood. She stopped at Charlie. The mission is tough, but simple. We have received word that the rebels from the lowest sectors are planning an assault on the public level. It's just our luck that they've picked our vertical for their operation. The informant didn't have their precise target, but he gave us a general location and time. She turned and activated the holographic 3D map of the city, zooming in on their vertical of Sector 5. Yeah. Chen pointed. Somewhere in a three-click radius of the central square, there's a school here. She turned to see if everyone was paying attention. Then there's the main water pump for the higher levels in this area, and... The main power terminal. Charlie panicked. That feeds the entire city of Gamaniam with electricity. Chen finished her thought. We best pray to Gamma Soul that they're not targeting the terminal, and if they are, we would get to them in time. They're not crazy enough to take down the power, are they? Hold any questions until the end of the briefing, Private Miller. She scolded him and then continued. We are to use only the necessary force to incapacitate the rebels. They must not be severely injured or least of all killed. I repeat, the rebels must not be terminated as is protocol. The prince has a different idea about what we shall do with them. Chen paused for a moment. There was something about that directive from Terra Neon that bothered her. It made her angry that the governor was right. When the last hail rings at sundown, we begin our descent. No power leeway for this up, which means no elevators and no trains. We do this on foot, stealth mode. Once we pass sectors two and three, we can't be sure if the rebels don't have spies working for them. Some in Sector 4 have been very unruly these past few months because of the power restrictions there. Treat all unknowns as hostiles from then on. If we see anyone out, that is. Chen paused and stepped closer to the line of soldiers again. Which brings us to the question that's on everybody's mind. How will we deal with the crawlers in stealth mode? Well, we'll be avoiding Sector 2 altogether through the elevator shafts, 
moving in directly on three, where we'll be using the stun traps. But once we touch down on four, we'll need to get uh, creative. Charlie flinched. Not the blades, he thought. That kind of combat was too intimate for his liking. Mycotoxins, sourced from our very own mycelium that lives on the dark side of this planet. Chen said and grinned at the shocked gasps from her troop. Yes, yes, I know. They haven't been tested in the field yet, and I know you've heard the gruesome stories. But I assure you, we'll be safe. Our newest recruits will make sure of that, since they will be operating the front and back of the team, taking care solely of the toxin cloud until we get to the public sector and reach our targeted location. Miller, Cohen, you will report to the lab for a special briefing on the bioweapon before we leave. Charlie and Miriam acknowledged the delayed order, then glanced nervously at each other the moment the commander turned her back to them. She began explaining the final leg of their mission, bringing the rebels back to the brig in Sector 1 and getting them ready for planetary displacement per Terra Neom's directive. Charlie had barely the attention to listen to her, as if the crawlers weren't enough. He wished he hadn't known what happened to the last batch of test subjects of the mycotoxin. People weren't completely unaffected by it, he had heard. Chen's voice was coming in and out of focus while he was dreading his role in the mission and thinking about every possible worst case scenario. Miriam noticed that his eyes were darting around the room in a frenzy and gave him a little nudge with her elbow. He took a deep breath, remembered his psych training, and refocused on the briefing. The commander was ready to dismiss them. Charlie had missed it. What will we do with the rebels during nightfall? Where will we keep them? And alive? Slightly calmer than a few moments earlier, he gave the questions a passing thought, then realized that Miriam would just tell him after the briefing. Remember, citizens. Neri's voice became the ticking clock that reminded both the military and the rebels of the fast approaching night. Sundown was just a few hails away. Eight levels down, Safia was making the last adjustment to the EMP generator. The vicinity of the terminal where all the power lines met would make sure that the entire city would be left without power until the rebels patched up the terminal and restored power from the main inverter in Sector 12, protected well below the ground. She and the rest of the rebels were ready for the dangers of perpetual nightfall. Moreover, they had warned all of the lower sectors to be ready for it when that time comes. Secure your night seals and don't go outside until the power is restored. The message said, echoing Neri's words without the familiar hail. The rebels were risking a lot sending that message out, but they wanted no casualties from their own. They were lucky that the only snitch that ever got to the higher levels of Gamma Neom was Franz, the one that had been working for them, or at least one of their factions. Vera was watching Sophia work from the shadows of the hidden room. Her granddaughter believed what she had told her, that Gamma Neom could be overtaken, and negotiations with Terra opened peacefully. But that wasn't the whole truth. The rest of it, Sophia had learned by overhearing secret conversations between the elders over the years. 
That was also how she found out what happened to her parents. Was it where I told you? Vera asked Sophia as she was placing the hefty battery inside the EMP generator. Sophia could see her in the periphery, but she waited for her grandmother to speak first. This was going to be their last conversation before she left their housing compartment at sundown, possibly never to return. Just as you said, Sophia returned. I think its disappearance might have caused a bit of a stir during the night. Vera chuckled. I hope none of the soldiers dispatched at Sector 5 got hurt, though. Sophia added. They know how to handle the crawlers with their weaponry. Vera assured her granddaughter that she wasn't the cause of any pain. Sophia clicked the last panel on the generator shut and took a step back. All done. Both of them admired what it represented in a moment of hopeful silence. It was the thing that would tip the scales in their fight against the Terran oppressors. Then, Vera took Sophia's hand and without turning to look at her, said, Be careful, Faye. Come back to me in one piece, bringing good news of tomorrow. We're ready. Abraham's voice beckoned from the compartment. Last hail in a few minutes. In a short sequence of actions, Sophia kissed her grandmother's hand, rushed to get the generator on a cart, and wheeled it out of the hidden room without saying goodbye to her. She was met by Abraham and his twenty strong in the main part of the housing compartment. Sophia didn't know they all had custom weapons, put together from parts of scavenged electrolaser rifles and stun traps, hidden under their dark robes. Remember, citizens, never stay up at night. Always lock your doors and remember to check your energy consumption. His Majesty, the Terran Prince, salutes you for your obedience. Instantaneously, the flight toward the public sector began. The rebels unleashed from their compartment in the 25th vertical of Sector 9. The Special Forces troop called out the day's last hail to the Prince, then prepared to slide down the elevator shafts moving toward Sectors 2 and 3 in the same vertical. All were headed to their potential doom at the central point that divided the space of the Line City on a horizontal plane, but its society on a vertical axis. Gamma Neom would mark this nightfall as the most important historical moment since the Terran year of 10789 when the city on Trappist-1D was declared officially completed. That had been almost one millennium ago. The crawl through the elevator shaft was a nasty endeavor, one that was reserved by the military of Gamma Neom for special ops only. All 12 soldiers in Charlie's troop were inching down the pitch black shaft that was one of the filthiest places in the entire city. Before installing the special security systems to ward off the nightcrawlers, the elevator shafts were the favorite location for the creatures to haunt during the day. They left their mark inside too. Feces were plastered from top to bottom, highest to lowest levels, unable to be cleaned by any method the cleaning crew could come up with. Not even the bots could get in there and rid the tight shafts from all the gunk without expending too much power. Between security and sanitation, the former won the fight. Bones and entire corpses were suspended still in the corners where the elevators didn't touch the walls 
reaching out from the darkness like mummies recovered from an ancient bog. Forever in agony. Forever a grim memory of the moment of their death. Or what came just after. Inching past a body frozen in time, just on the side of the ladder glued to the metal wall, Charlie almost slipped and fell to his death, trying to avoid its grasp. He didn't want to end up like that. He didn't want an elevator for a grave, or whatever place the Nightcrawlers called home presently. Sector 12, he thought. That's where they stay during the day now. I can swear someone mentioned that was closest to their natural habitat in the deep darkness below ground. Move. Charlie heard Chen snarling from above. At this rate, we'll need three nightfalls to get to Sector 5. What are you doing? Why'd you stop? He was glaring into the pit of the shaft, stopped in place by an intense odor coming from the level below him, hiding the fact that his thoughts were what paused his descent in truth. Chen was just above him on the ladder, followed by the rest of the troop, ending with Miriam farthest from him. We're reaching Sector 3, Commander. I can see the opening in the shaft. Charlie eventually replied. Confirmed. I can smell the night stink from here. Chen replied, then addressed the whole troop. That's our stop, boys and girls. Get ready to catch some nightcrawler meat for the foodies in Sector 1. Slow and steady. Let the stun traps keep them fresh for us on our retreat. The rebels, more than a few sectors down, weren't as loud and trigger-happy for the nightcrawlers as the soldiers were. They planned to avoid the creatures at all possible cost because, unlike the military, they had gained respect for the beings whose planet they inhabited. Respect out of fear, that is. For the nightcrawlers didn't smell any difference between them and the people above Sector 5. Those housed in the lowest four living sectors of Gamma Neom had learned over the centuries how to handle nightfall without becoming food and without firing a weapon unless absolutely necessary. Additionally, Abraham and his small army wanted to keep all the gunpowder they had for the troop they were expecting to confront in Sector 5. While the military had all the energy at their disposal, the rebels and the common men did not. It took the rebels more than three months of power rations to fuel their weapons and a few sneak charges in the public sector where the military had weapons charging corners. The 20 rebels were all flanking Sophia and the precious cargo she was wheeling behind her. All were as silent as mice on their feet, hoping that the sound of the squeaky cart won't draw too much attention on them from the nightcrawlers. Choosing the path of light, always, they were moving across the lit train rails. The neon lights were the only thing with a supply of electricity remaining at nightfall. However, their glass tubes tended to burst and needed changing often, like everything else did in Gamma Neon, making every task a risk. A few of the lights suddenly went out just as the rebel squad was moving closer to the bridge that would lead them to Sector 8. The instant darkness began to settle around them, and the nightcrawlers braved to draw near. One of the rebels scaled the short pole of the closest light and rushed to change the tube. The night stink was seeping through the air. The crawlers were drawing nearer. They were behind them, above them, 
filling the tide space almost completely with their bodies. By the time the rebel was taking out the first tube, a second rebel was moving toward the next pole to light the path further down the rails. Pancake on the rails, Abraham whispered. There was no way that all of them could outrun the creatures of the night that were on the prowl for food. The woman that was standing next to Sophia was worried that the night crawlers had already sensed them. She was panicking. Sophia made herself as small as she could and dropped behind the cart with the generator. She could see one of the crawlers inching its way through the shadows, headed straight toward them. The woman was sure that the two of them could make a run for the bridge and was getting ready to run. No, do as we've trained. Don't move. Abraham yelled out, glancing in front of him to see if Sophia was panicking as well. But the woman couldn't just wait for the crawlers to lose interest. She jumped to her feet and sprinted toward the bridge that was just a couple of deadly meters away. Stay down! Stay down! Abraham commanded the rest, knowing that there were a few heroes among them that would try to help without a second thought. Huddle around the center! Protect the generator! As the rebels squirmed toward Sophia, the nightcrawler that was headed in her direction swiftly turned and chased after the panicked woman. The massive but lean, worm-like shape of the creature coiled and uncoiled as it rolled through ground, wall, and ceiling. It was barely visible, but the sound its body was making told Abraham that the woman wouldn't reach the bridge. The odor the night crawler emitted, colloquially known as night snake, intensified as it was reaching its prey, making the rebels gag uncontrollably. They all heard the fast slither of the night crawler's body on the rails, then a scream and a thump. The woman was dead, ingested whole preserved for now in the stomach of the vile creature. During the attack, Abraham was the only one from the rebel squad with his finger on the trigger of his custom electrolaser pointed at the cart, waiting. He could afford to lose one fighter, but not the generator or Sophia. Step one was crucial to his plan. He was prepared to make the shot only if necessary. The neon lights clicked and illuminated the rails of the sector train again, chasing away the few night crawlers that had gotten dangerously close to the pile of rebels protecting their center point. Sophia peeked out from the pile. Head down! Abraham yelped again. Stay down! Wait! Just above them, coiled on the high walkway, was a baby nightcrawler with its mouth gaping open and drooling from the smell of them. One wrong move and Sophia would have lost her head. Don't lose your heads like last time, Chen told her soldiers who were still some six sectors above the rebels. Same vertical, same threat, different approach. She and Charlie were standing on one side of the narrow step at the opening of the elevator shaft. Sector three was just beyond it, a shadowy void filled only with the stink of the night crawlers. Chen glanced up the ladder where the rest of her troop was, Two of them were already hanging off the side, ready to jump down on the step when ordered. Miriam was high up above all of them, tugging at the heavy toxin canister, trying not to lose her grip on the metal ladder. 
The commander shook her head, realizing that she made a mistake giving Cohen and Miller such a huge task. It was a disaster waiting to happen. One of her arms was resting on Charlie's shoulder, and she could tell that he was shaking too. Calm down. Chen spoke silently so that only Charlie could hear her. Yesterday was a learning experience. Use it, soldier, and don't let the fear take over. That will only get you killed. Orders, Commander, he said, a little offended that she would treat him like a child the moment when he needed most to feel like a man. Chen tapped him on the shoulder to switch places with him so she could scope out the terrain in front of them. There was no sight of the creatures, but she could hear the crawling of a terrible body somewhere nearby. Prepare a stun trap, Private, she ordered, then signaled the others to follow quickly. The commander leaped out of the shaft and was instantaneously met by a nightcrawler that was waiting for them just above the opening. Thankfully, she already knew it was there, so she curled herself up in a ball and rolled away, distracting the creature long enough for Charlie to trap it. His reaction was so fast that the only thing that followed the sound of Chen rolling away was the hissing of the nightcrawler before it passed out from the powerful stun of the trap. Moments after, the rest of the troop were jumping out of the shaft two by two, immediately moving deeper inside the sector and securing their position. Charlie waited for Miriam, and the two of them were the last to exit. Only one! Chen was baffled. By the stench of the place, there should have been at least five crawlers in the vicinity. Stay on high alert. They might be hiding. She added, after looking around for a moment in silence. Charlie was standing over the trap, checking if the night crawler was completely out. It was secured to the ground, and a little green light was blinking on the side, giving Charlie enough confidence to move closer and inspect the crawler more intently. There was barely any light in the corridor in front of the elevator coming from the distant neon, so he had to strain his eyes to be able to discern any of the features of the beast that lay motionless before his feet. Even comatose, it looked dreadful. It had no eyes, no ears, face, or any other characteristic that Charlie or any human would recognize as familiar. Cold sweat swept over him, and a shiver rushed through his body. So he leaned even closer. Charlie could hear the nightcrawler breathing and noticed its torso expanding and shrinking. Suddenly, the notion that this thing was a living being took away a little of his fear. The experience didn't eliminate all of it, but enough to allow some recovery of his courage after his previous encounter with one of those things. How many times do I have to give the same order? Chen shouted at Charlie. Move! He was so invested in the Nightcrawler and his thoughts about it that he hadn't even heard her bark out the orders. At the sound of her voice, the Nightcrawler flinched, and Charlie almost blasted it with his electrolaser. One of the senior soldiers that witnessed the entire thing laughed, then rushed to the front of the troop, leading them deeper into Sector 3. I hate this silence, Charlie thought, after almost half an hour of trekking the narrow passageways and climbing down walkways through the empty and night-sealed sector. It was foreboding, 
ominous. They all felt it. Stop! Chen raised a fist in the air. She felt the heaviness of the silence as well, but didn't understand why it bothered her more than usual. Something's not right. Let's clear this sector fast. Bridge to four, on the double. The rebel squad had already ascended to Sector 7, having barely any more trouble with the Nightcrawlers. All remembered what happened when one would panic and stray from the training that most people in the lower sectors got since they were children. But still, only the bravest went out at nightfall. And only if it couldn't be helped. The woman that lost her life back in Sector 9 lost her nerve because she never truly faced a Nightcrawler until that fateful moment. She wanted to take part in the mission so badly that she had lied to Abraham's group when they were recruiting some months back. In essence, she had good reason to do so. A selfish one, but valid nonetheless. It wasn't the fight that she believed in, nor a better tomorrow. She wanted revenge on the city because she had lost a child to the military like many others from the lower sectors. The children were surrendered by their parents in hopes that they would be provided a better life high up in Sector 1, Offworld, or maybe even Terra Neom if the child was lucky. This was what they all believed happened to their children. Many never got an answer to where they ended up being relocated. This woman, however, got word that her only daughter was killed on military duty while guarding the governor of Gamma Neom. Body never recovered. No further explanation. Her anger was fueled by their secrecy. Abraham explained to Sophia. She confided in me a while back why she wanted to join us. I should have turned her away. But then again, I should have turned most of these people away. Why didn't you shoot it? Sophia asked, eliciting a nervous glance from the rebel helping her wheel the generator. Shoot it? I saw you with the electrolaser. I saw it in your hands. You could have saved her. Abraham dismissed the rebel and took hold of the generator. They were walking side by side on Sector 7 rails, drenched by neon. Everyone else was silent, except the two of them. Three nightcrawlers had been preying on the rebel squad since Sector 8, careful not to slither in the light and perish like the young one that couldn't resist attacking them previously. The baby crawler got caught in one of the rebel stun traps and got stunned by the force that would have taken out a specimen five times its size. The trap burned it to a crisp. There are some things you are too young to understand. Abraham replied after a very long pause. And others that you're just as too stubborn like your grandmother to accept. I don't feel like I owe you an explanation. I know you're planning something, Abraham. I'm not as naive as you or my grandmother seem to think I am. He stopped. They were coming close to a small patch of unlit railing that led to a system of makeshift ladders, built by the people of Sector 7 when the elevators in the lower levels were decommissioned more than two centuries ago. The three nightcrawlers preying on them needed to be handled before the rebels would move to the next stage of their journey upward. Abraham looked around, assessing their situation, while the rest of the rebels were passing him and Sophia, leaving them behind on the rails and stopping at the last light. We'll have to risk the traps again. There's no other way, Abraham said, and motioned for two of the rebels to take hold of the generator, and two more to set up the traps. 
We can only spare two more. I'll take care of the third crawler. One of the rebels, already setting up the traps, heard Abraham's decision, but he didn't like it. Instead, he proposed to stay back to make sure the traps were working properly, then lure the last creature away from the rest. That's a death sentence! Sophia gasped. Then we'll make it count. Abraham grabbed Sophia's arm and pulled her toward the rest of the people huddled at the last light just under the ladders. Among the twenty of them, only two lanterns were positioned strategically so they could light their way through the laddered maze. Needless to say, that wasn't enough to ward off the creatures that would soon be chasing after them. The two rebels that were setting up the traps were anxiously looking up and around for the night crawlers they could smell approaching. On my mark! Abraham addressed the squad. The traps were set. The people were ready. The generator was in the hands of two rebels that would carry it. Sophia was barely breathing. She was stuck in a situation that she didn't know how to handle. Two sacrifices were already too many. They were all preparing to scale the ladders as fast as they could to reach the next sector before the three night crawlers hunting them would be joined by more. One of the rebels setting up the traps was already standing next to Abraham, while the other was waiting for the squad to start moving up to activate them. Now! Abraham shouted, and everyone took flight. They were all scaling through the system of ladders like they were on fire. Sophia heard the stun traps activate and the distant hissing of two nightcrawlers. The man that stayed behind was already running in the opposite direction with the third creature on his tail. Unlike the woman, he knew how to outrun and outsmart a charging crawler since he had done it many times before. Though never for that long and with the same intent as this time. Nobody heard his last breath. He died alone in the dark gray shadows of Gamma Neom once the crawler caught up with him. The rest of the rebels continued onward, rushing to get to the public sector before the soldiers. Abraham was pressing them as much as he could without endangering their whole operation with any miscalculation concerning the night crawlers. From that moment on, they all ran like they had done this trek together countless times. No one wanted to lose another soul before the real work in Sector 5 began. High up, between Sectors 3 and 4, Charlie's troop had finally found out where the night crawlers, whose stink filled the place from one end to the other, were hiding. There weren't five of them, but twice the number. The commander ordered her soldiers to stop and lay low behind the last partitions on three, just as they were getting ready to pass the steep tunnel that led to the next sector on foot. There was no detour. This was the only way down. She couldn't believe the sight, and tried holding her anger back so that her men and women wouldn't see it on her and panic. The situation at the tunnel was one of the highest forms of decadence that sectors one through three of Gamma Neom regularly engaged in. Commander Chen had hoped that she would avoid that by scaling down the elevator shaft past sector two were the ones best known to engage in nefarious activity at night lived. While she was out there every nightfall protecting the citizens of all sectors above five, 
those same people held night raves in the tunnels because, unlike the ones from the lower sectors, they were bored out of their minds. These raves were the single reason that even Sector 4 had its power restricted, the same sector where the military families were housed. Flashing lights in all colors, charged up on Myco, derived from the same substance as the deadly toxins Miriam was carrying, these people were taunting the nightcrawlers and enjoying their hungry stink. They felt untouchable, defying death that permeated Gamma Neon from top to bottom. Most of the power they were draining from the grid and the lower sectors was concentrated in an energy shield custom made from stun traps, strong enough to burn the crawlers if they would touch it, but not enough to render them fully unconscious. It was keeping them away from the people, but not out of the tunnel. Bastards, Chen whispered. She was the one that had to save them when their shields got stormed by too many crawlers, and do the morning cleanup of the sectors they would endanger. Charlie was well aware of the consequences these parties had on the entire city. His first mission with Chen almost had him killed in Sector 2, protecting the governor's house party from a nightcrawler charge unlike any ever before seen. Ten soldiers died, and the power drained that nightfall completely shut down Sectors 8 and 9. Maybe we should let the rebels cut the power, if that's what they're doing. Chen mumbled. Commander! Charlie was shocked. Regardless of his own feelings about the situation, he would never expect that kind of talk from his superior. Cohen, up front! Bring the canister! Chen ordered Miriam. The girl fumbled but managed to get herself in the mycotoxin close to the front of their line. Prepare it? as they showed you. Miriam was stunned. Do it! The commander snarled. Masks on! She ordered the troop. Private Miriam Cohen, a girl from Sector 7 that joined the military the same way Charlie did, wasn't one of the lucky ones that got to go off-world. She never expected to attack the people she was raised to protect. Miriam pushed all the levers that would release the toxin in the canister and started the reaction turning it into a gas. She nodded to Chen once the delivery mechanism was ready to be activated. In response, the commander ordered three of the soldiers to protect Miriam in her approach to the tunnel. Charlie stood up, ready to join them. Stay here. The four of us will suffice, Chen said, then jogged toward Miriam and the rest with her electrolaser at hand and her mask covering her entire face. In the darkness where they were hiding, no one saw that Miriam didn't pull up hers. As they were approaching the tunnel, the little group was immediately noticed by some of the nightcrawlers. Chen ordered Miriam to continue moving forward and activate the toxin as close to the shield as possible. Simultaneously, she and the rest would take care of the crawlers slithering toward them in a fury. The nightcrawlers were beside themselves from hunger, drooling hissing, amped up so much that they were biting each other in anticipation of a huge meal. Miriam should have noticed that she wasn't wearing her mask when the night snake made her gag. But she pushed on and got almost to the shield when one of the people on the other side of it noticed her. 
He laughed and pointed at her like she was part of the amusement. The girl didn't realize that a crawler was uncoiling just behind her until Chen shot it dead and it fell just next to her. The situation prompted Miriam to push the switch on the canister. And as she did, she instantly felt nauseous and began seizing from the toxin being released quickly and efficiently from its container. Everyone that was raving in the tunnel was struck with the same feeling. The colorful lights inside made it look like their entire bodies were breaking and twisting in utterly unnatural ways. The creatures were going through the same agony. Night crawlers were falling and seizing all around Miriam, foam coming out of their mouths instead of drool. One of them eventually smashed onto her and trapped her under its massive weight. Both were slowly dying in tremendous pain caused by the toxin attacking their nervous systems. Charlie was already running to help her when Chen stopped him midway. She had to elicit the help of another soldier to be able to stop him completely and drag him back to their hiding spot. The night crawlers that were not as affected by the toxin were still raging around the shield, trying to get inside the tunnel into the people. The troop needed to wait for it to play out completely because they could spare no more ammo. It took a few hours until all the night crawlers had stopped seizing and were lying dead around the shield for them to even consider continuing towards Sector 5 through there. Both Charlie and Chen were devastated, but she couldn't allow herself to show it. The commander lost four people, and she would potentially lose the entire city of Gamma Neom to the Nightcrawlers if she didn't get the remaining soldiers of her troop down to the public sector. Sunup was now at hand, and she knew that the rebels must have been close to their target by that point. This seems to be a pattern with you. She spoke to Charlie, who was seated in a back corner between the partitions where they were hiding. He was gripping his rifle, looking spent and defenseless. I said move. Charlie lifted his head toward her, still wearing his mask that was covering his swollen eyes. Move, he thought. Why? What's the point? He didn't feel like going anywhere. Sulking isn't going to bring her back on your feet, Chen commanded. Charlie took off his mask. No point, she added. The toxin has dissipated by now. Chen took off hers as well. He loaded the rifle. I can't run anymore. I'm tired. So tired. You can do more good alive than dead, Chen insisted. Stop wasting our time on your feet and move. Charlie was staring at her blankly. His thoughts were spiraling out of control. He remembered the main axiom of his psych training, but he couldn't make himself repeat it. He wondered how he was supposed to use this particular learning experience. Is my entire life going to be like this? What did I do to deserve it? I can't run from them anymore. Two minutes, Private. If you're not on your feet by then, we're leaving you behind. Chen was firm. She meant every word. It was a difficult choice to make. Continue in the face of the absurdity of their constant battle after what he witnessed, 
or simply give in to it. That choice loomed over the head of every single soldier of Gamma Neon. Charlie was just a little new to the game. He wondered if Chen ever felt like he did. Did Miriam, in her last few moments? He stood up slowly. Remember, soldier. Charlie repeated the axiom he learned in psych training internally at last. Darkness is always followed by light. He walked out into the walkway until he was faced with the aftermath of the rave at the tunnel. The troop had disabled the shield and the raving lights and was already moving through it. He was looking at them dodging the dead bodies, human and nightcrawler, and shook his head. Some of the nightcrawlers were so amped up and confused that they had started devouring each other before perishing. And then light is followed by darkness again. But we must press onward. Charlie threw his electrolaser on his back and began sprinting toward the troop, closing his eyes when he passed by Miriam's corpse. There were only eight of them left. Sector 4 was almost completely void of nightcrawlers as well. Most of the ones that had come out that night, the troop had found on the other side of the tunnel, dead and twisted from the toxin. However, the troop didn't dwell on it much, least of all Charlie. He continued sprinting after they passed the tunnel, keeping a fast pace that the troop automatically followed. Charlie shifted gears. He was working on automatic. He wanted the night to be over and everything fade into memory until his heart stopped hurting and his mind wasn't spiraling toward the abyss. Chen was running at the far end of the line, guarding their backs and dealing with the loss in her own way. They arrived in the public sector, very close to sunup. Everything was still night sealed and empty. There wasn't any sign of the rebels, nor was there a sign of any damage that they might have done. Spread out, two by two. I want a pair on lookout up that high walkway, another at the school, and one at the water pump. Chen quietly ordered her soldiers before they walked deeper inside Sector 5. Miller, you're with me. Let's see to that terminal. The four pairs of soldiers crept into the public sector, cautious of their surroundings weary of night crawlers and rebels just the same. The first ones to arrive at location were the two that took the lookout. They threw their kit ropes in the air to get there as fast as possible, waited for the magnets to latch on the railing, and shimmied up toward the walkway in a second. From that vantage point, Almost the entire length of the 25th vertical of the public sector was visible, and the central square was accessible in a heartbeat. One of them laid down flat on the walkway and positioned his electrolaser on the railing, pressing his eye immediately on the scope. The second soldier did a check on their stun traps, put a few out at arm's reach, then took out their binoculars. Still no sign of the rebels. And there weren't any night crawlers moving around either. However, at closer inspection, she noticed that there were at least six, possibly seven, active and packed stun traps spread out all over the sector. That was their proof that the rebels had already been there. She peeked to the south end of the square where the school was, and saw the second pair approaching it as ordered. There was one active stun trap with a comatose crawler close to the entrance. 
inching toward the center of the square where the water pump was located, the third pair was moving back to back. They were the ones most exposed, at high risk of getting shot down or attacked by a crawler. There were three active stun traps all along their route, but thankfully not a single night crawler on the hunt. The soldier on lookout continued scanning the sector for bogies for a few more minutes. Everything that she saw from her perspective on the walkway indicated that the rebels had been there. The only things that were missing were the rebels themselves, or any obvious pointer to their potential target. She looked down at Chen and gave her the all clear. The commander was glancing up at the lookout every other second, while she and Charlie were moving toward the main power terminal to the north end of the square. It also happened to be the only point with the least visibility from the high walkway since it was blocked by a high Neary column. Before it got decommissioned a long time ago, it had been an individual access point to the AI's database. Now it was just a piece of architecture. Very few things in Gamma Neon work the way they were imagined. Automation became less and less of an option as the problems with power collection and accumulation grew, without Earth ever updating their technology. Stay vigilant, Miller. Don't zone out on me now, Chen said. It was more of a plea than an order. Charlie's senses were on fire at this point. After leaving Sector 3 in the tunnel behind, he had been running solely on adrenaline, full survivor mode. The first thing he noticed was that the night stink was less heavy in this sector, the way it usually smelled at sunup when the night crawlers had retreated after the first bright lights shocked the entire city to rid it of the last of them. It took him a moment to notice that there was a second smell together with the lingering odor of the crawlers. Burning flesh. Faint. But it was there. Charlie didn't know what to make of it, and thought that it was just a sense memory from the hours spent hiding next to the tunnel, listening to the seizing crawlers scorch themselves on the shield. He soon discovered he was wrong. Coming up on our 12, the commander said. They were approaching the first stun trap on their way to the terminal. The closer they got to it, the clearer the view of the thing that was confined inside. The trap had either malfunctioned, burning its victim fully, or it was rigged up like that. Unexpectedly, the possibility that the rebels had positioned death traps for them all over the sector became a new threat they were facing. Charlie shuddered at the thought as the two of them cleared past the scorched body that looked more human than Crawler. The main terminal was hidden behind a protective cover on one of the most distant walls to the sector. It was far from any tunnels, bridges, or walkways. The single way to get to it was either from the side of the square or the elevator that was just next to it for easy access in the earlier days of Gamma Neon. When the elevators in the sector were active, the maintenance crew had sole access to that particular one. At first glance, the protective cover was still on top of the terminal and looked undamaged, which gave Chen and Charlie some hope that it either wasn't the target of the rebels, or that they still hadn't gotten to it yet. Suddenly, a chain of events unraveled so quickly one after the other that it left both the private and the commander in a daze. Chen heard noises coming from the high walkway. She ordered Charlie to guard the terminal and walked out past the Neary column to see what was happening. 
The lookout pair had moved position a few meters down and were glued toward the south end of the square, scoping out the school. Commander Chen lifted her electrolaser and peered through her own scope. She couldn't see the second pair of soldiers anywhere, but noticed that one of the night seals on the school appeared to be broken. The door was wide open. Normally, that wouldn't have been a big deal, since there weren't any people inside the school during nightfall. However, Chen had to take into consideration that the rebels might have broken in to hide, or had targeted the school and were setting up all kinds of dangers for the next day. She wouldn't put it past them to drag the packed stun traps inside, rigging them up to open when the first school bells rang at sunup. Chen made eye contact with the third pair that was approaching the water pump and signaled them to check out the school. She remained in position, close to the terminal, and with one eye on the pump. Simultaneously, Charlie heard some noise coming from the elevator. He walked slowly over to it and saw that the hatch had been released. A few blasts from distant rifles echoed in the silence of the central square. Outgoing location unknown. Two stun traps zapped, and the soldiers that were on the walkway got trapped by their own devices, activated by the lightning of the electrolasers. The pair was screaming as the stuns were burning them alive. Chen looked up in horror, then immediately ducked, and hid behind the Neary column. She glanced toward the school and saw that the third pair that was headed in that direction was being dragged inside by an unknown number of offenders. As soon as they were inside, she heard more weapons firing and the blaze of their lighting behind the doorframe. Miller! Chen called after him without turning. Private! She yelped after a second. Charlie! Meanwhile, he was standing with his arms in the air, electro laser dropped on the ground, and peering into the darkness of the open elevator hatch right in front of him. One wrong move, and you'll be joining your friends in the afterlife. Charlie could barely see the man speaking to him from inside the shaft, but he knew that there was a weapon pointed straight at him. Do as he says. He heard Chen's voice behind him. She was prompted to turn from the sound of the voice coming from inside. Neither she nor Charlie understood why they were still alive when the others were so easily and quickly killed. To add to the drama, the alarms that signaled sunup at the start of the day began flashing the public sector with a blindingly bright white light. Some of the crawlers that were barely coming out of their coma hissed and twisted. In the seconds between the last flashes, Charlie heard footsteps running up to them and the voice from the shaft calling out his name. Charlie? The fifth intense light flashed, then the regular daytime illumination started shining through all sectors and verticals. Remember, citizens, never stay up at night. Always lock your doors. Neri's voice began calling out the first hour of the day, then immediately stopped. Chen and Charlie were gaping at the opening of the shaft at the man that was now lit enough to become recognizable to both of them. The commander still held her electrolaser close to her, but it was pointed toward the ground. She felt an intense zap coming from it and instinctively dropped the rifle from her hands. Her palms were red hot and blistering. After a short lag, Neri's voice boomed through the speakers again. Warning, power corrupted. Warning, power grid phase corrupted. Warning, power grid phase returned. Warning, warning. 
Neri's voice began distorting until she could no longer be heard echoing throughout Gamma Neum. The crawlers were released from the stun traps, thankfully still comatose. All weapons were rendered useless, and the lights had completely shut down again. Everything became a shadow. Perpetual nightfall had finally come. Safia's generator had worked. Hear, hear! The hail of twenty-ish people was heard from all corners of the public sector, and it kept echoing from Sector 5 all the way down to Sector 9, behind secured night seals. Hear, hear! Abraham said as he exited the elevator shaft and faced Charlie. He looked like he was about to burst into tears. Son? Abraham! Chen cried out. He turned swiftly toward her with a look of disgust and disappointment on his face. A soldier? He asked her. Is this what I gave up my son for? You were supposed to send him off world. Terra Neum! Anything else? Chen shook her head. You were supposed to save him! Abraham screamed. I did, she whispered. What does that mean? Best you never find out, Chen replied, looking at Charlie. You people with your secrets. Abraham was fuming. He signaled his men to bind Chen's arms and paced in front of the elevator, thinking about his next move. The sudden joy of seeing his son again was demolished by the realization that he was turned into a soldier. One of them. The enemy. Abraham couldn't bear giving Charlie another glance, let alone stand and face him again. Charlie, on the contrary, couldn't stop looking at his father. He followed him with his gaze. He couldn't speak. He couldn't think. He couldn't move but do just that. Eighteen remaining rebels joined them near the column. They placed one of their final lanterns in the circle that they formed around Chen and Charlie. Some of them had never seen a soldier up close because they had never been higher up in Gamma Neum than the sector they were born into. And yet, they were still afraid. Even with the two of them practically defenseless before them, one bound by rope and the other by confusion, the rebels still found them terrifying. Moreover, some of them had blood on their hands from killing the soldiers in the school. And yet, they didn't even dare to come too close, especially to the commander. The stories that were shared about the brutality of the military among the lower sectors had preceded them. They were almost as dreadful as the night crawlers to the common people that had only heard what the soldiers did to those that broke the third rule of their city. The rule that, at the moment, had lost all meaning. After darkness, light. Charlie was beginning to come back to his senses. Twenty years had passed since he had seen his father. Twenty years since he was forbidden to look for him, to speak to him, or to even think about him. And then darkness again. All the adrenaline had begun draining from his body. He shook and shivered, then turned away from Abraham to face Chen. The sight of her was shocking. He'd never seen his commander look the way she did presently. She looked defeated, her stern gaze softened toward the ground, her body limp and listless. She might as well be dead, he thought. But then she spoke. Why did you do this? Do you have any idea 
What's going to happen now? We do. Sophia answered instead of Abraham. The girl had been the single rebel that was brave enough to stand close to the commander and even to speak back to her. She had been inspecting her and Charlie curiously for some time while they were both stirring inside their minds. Abraham had stopped pacing and was whispering something with the few rebels that had gathered around him. They were informing him that they had lost two more, one in the fight inside the school, and the second had fallen into the stun traps that were set up for the night crawlers in the few days leading up to their sole operation, even before he took his position in the ambush. One of the older rebels was worried that they were staying out for too long, tempting fate, for the night crawlers would soon come out of their comas, joined by others from below, to begin their hunt. Two groups. Abraham spoke loudly so that everyone could hear him. One will hide in the school as planned. The second one, led by myself, will trek to Sector One with the prisoner to confront the governor. I'll need a volunteer to accompany me. Prisoner. Singular. Does that mean he doesn't see me as a threat? Charlie wondered, but kept his thoughts to himself. The commander looked up at him. She couldn't tell what he was thinking, nor how he would react to this new situation. Does she see me as a threat now? He looked away from Chen, unable to hold her gaze anymore. I suggest we make an additional group, Sophia said. Someone needs to check the inverter and restart it. Chen gasped then laughed out of relief. A sliver of hope appeared in her eyes again because she could deduce what Sophia meant. Not all was lost. Hold your tongue, stupid girl, Abraham yelled at her. You might as well tell the governor that. Now she knows, how will I take her to Sector One with me and make our demands? I'm glad you're not as big of a fool as I thought you were for a second. <laughs> Chen was still laughing. Abraham shot a glance at Charlie. Maybe I should take him then, in her stead. No, I'll play along with your plan on one condition. She added before Abraham could respond anything. Charlie goes with the third group. There will be no third group. Then I will descend to Sector 12 alone. Sophia interjected. It was obvious to everyone that she didn't want Abraham making all of the decisions. She was already angry about what had happened so far, and that everything eventually did end up in violence. If there was one thing she could do, that was to save what remained of the original plan that the Council of Elders had devised. You still don't understand. Abraham got angry. We need to break with the old ways completely. If we continue to use the technology Terra Neon controls, they will keep controlling us as well. We will never be rid of them. Gamma Neon will never be independent. We will always stay in the darkness. And they will always have power over the light. Charlie was listening intently to the exchange between the three of them. He couldn't help but wonder what his role there was. Suddenly, he had no clear path, no sense of self, no daydreams to keep his anxious mind steady. The commander, Abraham and Sophia, kept on arguing and moralizing about their circumstance, but there were moments when it all went over his head. He heard Chen agreeing with Abraham that things needed to change, and also with Sophia that they still needed solar power to ward off the nightcrawlers and keep the city functional. 
Gamanium must find another way to produce power before we completely destroy everything, Abraham! Sophia was yelling. She was the youngest among the three, so her stakes were higher. Her emotions ran hotter. Both her courage and her fear were the most intense. Her life had barely even begun, and she didn't want to spend it in perpetual nightfall, running constantly from the night terror of the crawlers. I'll go with her. Charlie finally spoke out, leaving everyone speechless for a moment. That's not your decision to make, son. Neither is it yours. Chen felt relieved because she thought that Charlie was still loyal to her, regardless of who they found among the rebels. The reality was much different than whatever she might have guessed. The argument was already taking too long, and the rest of the rebels were getting restless. They had night crawlers to worry about, as well as their families that were left trapped behind the night seals of the lower sectors. Abraham was additionally worried that the longer they waited to get to Sector 1, the sooner a second troop from another vertical would be sent out to hunt him and his rebels down, making all of their efforts worthless. He had no other choice but to conform and go along with Safia's plan. It didn't take long for the rebel squad to huddle up in the school where they had left provisions and anything else that they might need for the long night ahead. Before they closed the door and sealed it, there was only one remaining thing to do, which was remove the bodies of the soldiers from inside. The commander stood next to the door and watched as the rebels carried the bodies and threw them out in the square like they were nothing. She noticed Abraham looking at her, expecting a reaction. She wouldn't give him the pleasure of seeing her suffer. Chen straightened herself up, held back the tears and screams that had been gathering inside her since Sector 3, and marched proudly toward him. I won't be of any use to you with my hands tied behind my back, she said. Your only task is to lead us to Sector One and the Governor. Your fighting days are over. The fighting will never be over for Chen. Charlie wanted to say as he was coming up to them, but instead stopped and saluted his commander. Abraham's face contorted with disgust and anger. Use your blade, Private. Don't be scared to face them the commander said, rather than saying goodbye. Goodbye forever. I expected you to volunteer to join me in Sector One. See this thing through together. Abraham interrupted. I go where I'm needed. Safia needs a soldier by her side if she's ever going to get to Sector 12. The Nightcrawlers will be relentless now. I understand, Abraham said. He sounded defeated, like he had lost his son all over again. Go through the elevator shafts. You won't survive the long way around. Another goodbye that sounded like something else. If only it was as easy as that. There was a reason why the rebels didn't take that route to the public sector in the first place and why they went through all the trouble of going the long way. The elevators for the lower levels hadn't been used in centuries for anything other than nightcrawler dung and the trash from the city that couldn't fit into their compactors to be incinerated on the sole side of the planet. Whoever was brave enough and small enough to fit inside would leave those shafts carrying disease and bacteria that hadn't been seen on the streets of the city for the longest of times. Sophia and Charlie were scaling down for an eternity, pushing through the graveyard of organic and inorganic matter. 
It was the unmentionable bile of two warring species that had found common ground in only one thing in the millennium in which they shared Gamma Neom. Waste. By the time the two of them had reached the last level that was still scalable, Chen and Abraham had already ascended to Sector 1. Though, in the true darkness of the Gamma Neomian underground, Charlie and Sophia could never have known that. Only on their returning trip would they ever find out if the operation of the Rebels had worked as planned and only if the two of them would ever survive the last three sectors of the city, which were buried deep into the crust of Trappist-1D. Not much was said between Charlie and Sophia during their descent until they left the shaft for good through an opening in Sector 10. It was completely different from all of the other ones that he had seen in his life. It was the first level that had never been intended for housing or living. There were air ducts pushing the gamma neomian air in a loop, and filtration chambers to clean it. Pipes that were supplying all the water to the city, and the pumps that pushed it from the ground to the highest end, a kilometer above to Sector 1. Hanging on the walls and ceiling were power cables, stretching out in all directions, all across the sector. Lastly, there could be found endless little nothings that had once made this city great, but were currently without purpose, obsolete. If the elevators were full of human skeletons, this sector itself the skeleton of the operating core for the automation of every single aspect of life in the perfect colony. Charlie stared at the rows of equipment he couldn't even understand. It was both aged and futuristic, an anachronism that seemed to fit what Gamma Neom had become and not what it was intended to be when the technology was first installed. Where are they? Sophia broke the silence between them, scared more by the lack of night crawlers than their presence. Sector 12, Charlie replied. Or more probably, already headed where the meat is. He pointed upwards. Sophia paused and gaped at him, shining her little lantern in his face. What happened to you, man? Are all soldiers like you? Because Chen... Charlie hushed her. He didn't want her opinion on Chen, on him, on anybody. What would a child know about anything? He continued walking the narrow corridor between the discarded tech, following a power cable that was hanging low from the ceiling. You're going the wrong way! Sophia called out to him. Then show me the right one. They were closing on Sector 11, passing through a complicated net of tunnels. Sophia's breathing became strained and shallow and Charlie could see the shake in her hands from the way the light of her lantern was dancing on the walls around them. Nightcrawlers, if they get us here, we're done for. There's no escape. Charlie realized how dark his thoughts were and could only imagine what Sophia was going through. It wasn't a sudden humanity that had returned to him, but the memory of Miriam, who could never let anyone suffer fear trapped in her mind like that. Smell the air, he said. Sophia glared at him for an instant. These tunnels aren't man-made, soldier. We've skipped an entire elevator level, and there's no other way down here. The air smelled stale with a note of that nightcrawler odor they both knew so horribly well. It wasn't fresh hunger they were smelling. 
Had it hinted at creatures long gone? Or simply sleeping somewhere in those tunnels they had themselves burrowed, unaware that their hunting ground was ripe for the taking in the long night ahead? And with an appetizer making its way directly to their lair. Charlie stayed back for a while, watching the light of Sophia's lantern diminish in the tunnels ahead. Fear was pressing again in his chest, tensing up his shoulders and neck, pulsating in his ears. This child knew more than him. She walked like she knew where she was going, not from a map or instruction, from experience. He hoped that Safia was leading him in the right direction. You were wrong, Safia said when he finally caught up to her. She was standing at the very edge of the tunnel. Uh, about? The Nightcrawlers. Sector 11 is their home. They never lower the foundations. Safia answered and then lit the opening of the tunnel in front of them. Look. The only thing that Charlie could discern in the light was the very first part of the vertical that the tunnels were leading up to. At this point, after passing the labyrinthine stretch of tunnels burrowed by the creatures, he had no idea if it was the 25th or the 37th they were looking into. It might even have been the prime vertical that welcomed the very first citizens of Gamma Neon some thousand years ago. The one thing was for certain. This sector was never meant for housing the Nightcrawlers. Remnants of laboratories with the same archaic technology that he had seen before were scattered about the place between the coiled bodies of young crawlers. Charlie flinched at the nasty sight and grabbed for his blade, which was the only piece of his equipment that survived the crawl through the elevator shaft. Too young to hunt. Safia stopped his hand. We can easily overcome them without any of that. She spoke quietly. These specimens were even younger than the one that had attacked her and failed to grab her way back in Sector 9, where her journey began. Charlie was gaping at the small, slithering creatures, vulnerable and blind in the deepest darkness of the city. Even their hissing didn't trigger the same fear response in him that full-grown nightcrawlers did. He closed his eyes and tried to imagine how many of them were actually there, sleeping and growing in Sector 11. Remember, soldier, Charlie tried to calm himself down. Darkness is always followed by light. How are we getting to Sector 12? He asked. Charlie felt Safia's hand on his arm and opened his eyes. She was pointing at a night seal curiously located in the ground, just a few meters away from them where the light could still reach. Charlie felt relieved that the girl didn't lose her way in the tunnels and knew exactly where they were going and where they would end up. Unfortunately, he also understood that the next part of their journey meant moving through the sleeping little monsters. Sophia led the way, pushing each crawler aside with her foot. Most of them were no more than half a meter long and had just a teeny tiny fraction of the weight of an adult. Step push. Step again. She turned and signaled Charlie to follow. He didn't have much time to think about it without risking getting stranded in the tunnels without a light. Step. Push. Stop. They heard distant hissing. Loud hissing. Coming closer. 
The little ones around them began squirming and vibrating, their little hisses calling back to mother. Charlie jumped towards Sophia without thinking, killing a few of the babies as he landed next to her. He grabbed her hand and pulled her toward the night seal. The hissing became louder and was joined by the sound of a huge body slithering closer to them. A waft of night stink caught up to them as Sophia was trying to get the seal open. Hurry! Charlie growled. He could already see the outlines of the worm-like body of the adult crawler moving fast in their direction. After the darkness light, after the darkness light, he kept repeating to himself, gripping the handle of his blade. However, the monstrous creature wouldn't even pause at the slash of his tiny weapon. In a second, Sophia and Charlie were on the other side of the night seal, pressing the door closed from below. Their escape had happened so fast that he couldn't even make out how it even happened. I couldn't reestablish the seal. Sophia confessed quietly. It won't take very long to bust through the door. That was it. Their death sentence. The entire city of Gamma Neom, with a population of more than 10 million, was now counting on two dead people to save them from eternal darkness. Let's move fast then, and get this over with. Sector 12 was a dark and cold pit. Sophia's lantern was already dimming, so Charlie couldn't get much of a glimpse of it. The only things he could see around them as they were running in the direction of the inverter were huge power cables lining the ground. Sophia seemed to be following a specific one that had markings on it still visible in the faint light. As they ran, their footsteps echoed in the empty and massive sector where verticals were never established. Suddenly, Sophia stopped running. This is it. A single partition appeared in front of them. Charlie shivered at the thought that only one inverter was keeping them all alive up to that point. He thought of it as minuscule compared to Gamma Neon as his blade to the body of a nightcrawler. He followed Sophia inside the partition with Abraham's words echoing in his mind. This one thing wasn't just keeping them alive, it was also keeping them enslaved. Were you never offered to Sector One? Charlie asked Sophia. She was already trying to find the right levers to push, to restart the inverter and get the city ready for a gust of power when the terminal would be fixed. The mechanism to restart the ancient inverter couldn't rely on anything involving electricity. It was based on good old fashioned cranks and levers that would only fail when the materials they were made from would succumb to time. The girl stopped working for a second. I noticed you were the only child among the rebels, he added. My grandmother decided to keep me in Sector 9. She didn't want me becoming military, like you, or worse. Sophia replied coldly. She didn't think you could make it off world? Charlie pressed. Off world? Sophia found the lever. Maybe even Terra Neom. Terra Neom! <laughs> she scoffed. Tell me, Sophia. Why did your grandmother keep you from ascending the sectors? She was getting angry and mumbling to herself, refusing to answer as she was cranking the old metal lever, trying to restart the inverter. After a few moments, a flash of light passed through the panels of the machine, and it started buzzing. 
One by one, the panels switched on fully, exhibiting an array of information and control dials. Charlie noticed that one of them was displaying a problem with the power grid high up in Sector 5, the 25th vertical, the main terminal. Service required. It simply stated in bold red lettering. Charlie wondered for a moment where Chan and Abraham were, and if the rebels back in the public sector would get word from them soon to fix the terminal. Was it done? Had the rebels gotten what they wanted? All done. Safia informed him on the state of their own mission. She looked grim, not at all how Charlie would have expected. There was a commotion somewhere in the distance from where they came. The Nightcrawler had broken through the door as expected. Soon, they would hear the hissing and smell the scent of the huge predator. Charlie was looking at Sophia, still waiting for a response to his question before they would perish. There is no off-world, she said eventually. Not in the way you think of it, soldier. And I would have never gotten to Terra Neom. No one ever has. The slither of the Nightcrawler's massive body echoed loudly through the sector. Its terrible hissing followed. Charlie was stumped. Their secrets. He remembered Abraham's words. What is Offworld according to you then? He asked, amazed at himself for giving Safia the benefit of the doubt at all. A few days ago, that would have elicited some kind of action from Sector 1 against her and him as well. Doubt threatens obedience. Humans are pliable creatures, I heard my grandmother say once. The hissing was getting closer. Night stink wafted through the air inside the partition. Charlie swiftly closed the door to give them a mere second more. This one didn't even have a night seal mounted on top of it for security. The night crawler that was hunting them was a rare occurrence in Sector 12. It had a reason other than hunger. At first, I wasn't sure what she meant by it. I was really young. But over time, I kept overhearing her and our Council of Elders talk about the things that have been done in the past by Terra Neom on our planet. What does that have to do with... Things that turned what was meant to be a human colony into an experiment. Sophia paused. She looked rattled by what she was saying, like she had trouble believing it herself. Like all the time she spent rummaging about it in her mind over the years had not solidified it as a fact yet. We're not citizens here, Charlie. We're something else. Monitoring what was happening outside by sound alone, Charlie took out his blade in response. For a split second, he wondered if he had meant it for the creature or the two of them but he wanted to hear the rest of Sophia's explanation before he made any kind of decision. She watched him, motionless. She had the same thought when she saw the blade in his hand. Humans, the way they were born on Terra, could never survive this planet, so they decided to mix their own material to that of the creatures that could. Sophia continued. And then... We were born. Safia, we don't have time. Tell me what all of this means. His voice cracked. I don't know what all of this means. I know that Gamma Neom isn't a city. I know that I'm not really human. The Nightcrawler's stink made Safia gag. It was just outside of the partition, coiling itself around it. Safia! What does off-world mean? He pressed. It means getting cataloged like a specimen. The experiment. 
They wanted to see how we would develop, how close to them we would remain, or how close we would get to. A hiss passed just by the door. The Nightcrawlers. How has your council of elders come to these crazy ideas, Safia? How do I know that these aren't some theories made up by your people to destabilize Gamma Neom? Charlie was freaking out and defaulting to his inherent way of thinking. Because Charlie, none of this was ever shared outside of the council. They don't want it known either. She replied. Unlike him, Sophia was unnaturally calm considering their situation. She had accepted her fate. Does Abraham know? He asked. He gave you up, didn't he? Sophia responded, as vague and uncertain as that answer was. The future of Gamma Neon was resting on the shoulders of two dead people. Charlie gripped the blade. He thought of Chen how she protected him over the years, and how she reacted to his father. There was some empathy nestled in her heart. But for what? He remembered her conversation with the governor before the operation. Suddenly, it made complete sense to him. He realized why she was so angry. Planetary displacement for the rebels she had said in their briefing, must not be terminated. Charlie looked at Sophia and imagined her fate if his troop had been successful in their op. She's just a child, he thought. Lastly, he could also grasp why their technology was left in such a devastating state. It had simply been left for them to handle. Its improvement became a Gamma Neomian duty and stopped being a Terran one the moment they left their experiment to run itself, only monitoring its progress. He gagged. The partition was beginning to crack from the force of the Nightcrawler's body, squeezing it tightly. It was hissing something terrible. It didn't want to eat them. It just wanted to hurt them. Where is this inverter most vulnerable? Charlie asked Sophia. She stared at him. Where, Sophia? The girl pointed to a cover close to the lever she had pressed, unaware of Charlie's intentions. He stepped next to her with his blade in hand, and she expected him to cut her throat open. But instead, he tore open the cover and jammed the blade into the wheels and cranks that were still turning while the entire system was booting up. There was a minuscule spark. Then all of the panels on the inverter showed a malfunction message. A warning. Power grid corrupted. It stated again in red. Power grid failure imminent. Charlie read on the one closest to him. Suddenly, the inverter completely shut down again. And then light is followed by darkness again. But we must press onward, Charlie thought, as the lantern that was the sole source of illumination in their final moments dimmed slowly and then went out completely. Hey, sci-fi horror fans. It's Christian Ayers. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to smash that like button. A huge shout out to all of our official members. We truly appreciate your support. Craving another scary tale? Click that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone, and remember, stay cosmic. <laughs>